On the morning of the national championship, Washington earned a commitment from the top in-state player in the class of 2025. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into the Locked On Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We write for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. You can check out all our written work over there at si.com slash college slash Washington. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply all right Lars so we had a whole lot of talk about the national championship game and one thing that we we had a lot of fun talking about on our, our post game reaction show after the the unfortunate loss was recruiting because like we just said in the open on the morning in the national championship four-star linebacker Zadrius Rainey Sale from Bethel High School in Spanaway Washington the number one player in the state of Washington number 72 in the country commits to UW over after, and this is this was a late flip, mind you, where he got projected to crystal, uh, he got the crystal ball projections to Florida State a couple of weeks ago, and then really, really late, they flipped to Washington. And of course, he makes his commitment after originally being scheduled to do so at the All America Bowl. And I, I just, I, I don't think we can understate how huge of a get this is. A, so early in the process, and B, he's just such a talented player, man. I think that that's the thing that you hit on for me. It's at this point in the process, right? Because now people right. will say, oh, well, he can still flip. It's like, right. But usually, and at least under DeBoer, it had been, hey, well, they'll commit elsewhere and then we'll try and flip them late. You know, it's like instead of being the school that's getting worked late, you're, you're now the school that's got to hold on to them. But that also means you're kind of the better program, right? Where it's like, hey, I'm willing to bet on these guys because he could easily have committed to Oregon or Florida State or done whatever, gotten the recognition, and then maybe a few months, you know, back, let's say May or June, he decommits, and then in this after the season commits to Washington. It's like, okay, cool. They, they kind of had to play catch up, and, they, and then they did. It's like, no, they played catch up before, and now they caught up and caught it. That's, that's I think, yep. the key. And so for people saying, can DeBoer recruit? It wasn't that he couldn't recruit. It was just it's hard to take guys knowing your class is going to be smaller and maybe you want him versus somebody else. Now you're in a position to say, hey, we need to build our class early. We're taking two defensive guys early to start the class, and we want you to be a key cornerstone so you can help recruit others to the class versus having others recruit you. I think that's a big so, difference. I, I, I want to I stop you right there because everything you're saying is valid and everything you're saying is correct, but it goes a little bit farther than that because everything you're saying I, – I, so I think your biggest and best point right there is the cornerstone thing, getting him in the boat so early. And it goes a step beyond just doing that and being the number one player just in the state of Washington. I'm going to say it again. He's the number one player in the state of Washington. And over the last two years, we've seen so many questions of, oh, can the staff recruit Washington? It doesn't seem like they're they're keeping these in-state guys home. So it's huge that they were able to do that because and something you and I have talked about a lot on this show. It's that the staff seems to have a very particular, you know, I just want to say mindset of what they want or what they're looking for when it comes to in-state players. And you watch this kid's film and he fits that bill just to a T. He's unbelievably fast he's got he's so explosive he could play inside or outside backer if you need him to i i just i really like his athleticism i really like the way he tackles and he looks like one of those guys who he might burn his red shirt as a true freshman because he's got the size he's got the athleticism he's got the tackling ability where you can plug him into the defense right away maybe as a rotational piece and he plays eight nine games for he's a true freshman but then on top of that i like this so as, as as much as we talked about the 2024 in-state class, I like this class a lot better in terms of top to bottom, what it is, what it can be. We talked about guys, we're gonna, and we're going to talk more about this. Guys like Noah Flores, Darian Clemens, Teandre Waverly, uh, Jonathan Epperson, who I know is committing here in a couple of days, and we'll kind of we'll see what happens with that one. I, I know neither of us have, have a really good read on that situation, which is a little bit interesting for a kid at Auburn Riverside. But the fact that they're getting the number one player in-state right away 
and we're going to, we're going to talk more about some of the, the out of state guys too, but just seeing this kid commit to Washington should create the momentum that I know a lot of fans were looking for that we said, we, I, it's something you and I, again, another thing you and I have talked about, just kind of saying, Hey, 2025, it's, it's going to look a little different. Like there, there, there are going to be some, some bigger names that, that are going to be considering Washington more heavily in 2025. Right, and I think it also kind of lined up with over the last two years, those guys as freshmen and sophomores were able to see these coaches and also get on campus for unofficial visits. So they got a head start on that process, right? So now, because you're not you're not just offering, say, you know, Ray Sale next six months ago, right? You you offered him sure. way way back in the beginning, understanding you'd have to build that. So and again, it's a credit to the staff because if they were really as bad as people say they are, which again, people are wrong, but I mean. If fans are, if there would be a reason to be concerned if they were like just now, be like, oh, hey, we probably should start prioritizing in state guys. Like, no, no, they've been trying to do that. Now you're going to get a class to where you're taking more high school guys and you want to build that out early yeah. versus waiting until June to be like, hey, now we kind of have an idea of who we want to target. Now let's try and get some of those guys in the boat. That so I think it's a right. mentality for the staff to say, hey, we're ahead of schedule. You know, we're we're now trying to build this thing out even further. How do you do that? Well, again, to your point, you get you start in the state. No, but again, to be fair, they also didn't technically start in the state, right? You get um, Josiah Sherman, Jackson Collick from California, and, Jack, and Jackson Collick from from, yeah. from California. But again, it's a quarterback, it's a defensive lineman, it's a linebacker. You're taking the key players, right? You're not taking a uh, yeah corner, right? You're not you're not taking a tight end, right? You know, it's like you could take a bunch of easy commits early just to put up some numbers, right? But sure. The staff is taking guys that they know for a fact they at least either want or will hold on to, and then can build from there. Say, so, okay, now we got our key cornerstone defensive lineman, our key cornerstone linebacker. We still probably are going to need two or three more players at that at both positions, but now we can see, okay, how does Brady say I'll line up against so and so, and are these guys yeah. a good pair to play on the field? Because this is the guy we want. Now that he's already in the, because that's the thing when you don't have those guys knowing you're in the boat then it's, okay, well, we like these four guys, but we have two spots, so whichever two commit first, then we'll make that work, whereas now you can plan out a little bit better. Right. And I think it honestly, to your point, is going to help with in-state recruiting, you know, with DeAndre Waverly and, and getting guys like that, where it's like those are the other pieces where you, especially like the, you know, you don't want to say the higher-end guys in the state over the lower-end guys, but that's kind of where Washington's at, right, where you're taking certain guys in the state of Washington, matching them with – Texas with California and building out your roster to be a more complete roster than to say, Hey, we're going to take eight of the top 10 Washington state guys, even though three of the three of those 10, three of those eight might not even play. It's it's kind of like, and I, I, I don't mean this in a, in a disrespectful way. It was like ta- taking Caden jumper and say a now a couple of years ago where from a recruiting standpoint, it was, they, they just, it felt like they were taking these guys just to take them. In, in, in a certain way where now we're looking at, you know, taking, you know, players like Dimitri Manning at Bellevue. When we're talking just Noah Flores, Darian Clements, we're getting those kinds of guys instead. And then saying, okay, we have this foundation of in-state guys and we're going to continue to recruit. And these are guys we're going to talk about in the next segment. Dijon Lee, Philip Bell, Mason Posa is a, a, a linebacker from, uh, from New Mexico who I'm really, really high on. I think that he's going to be a fantastic player. And, we're going to jump a lot more into that because there's so much to talk about in 2025, just in terms of the, the classes in general. But first, we're going to send a message to our friends over at LinkedIn at the start of the new year. Every small business is asking themselves the same question. What's the one move I can make that'll take my business to the next level in 2024? LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success all depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many qualified candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses Get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn also knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash lockdown college. That's LinkedIn.com slash lockdown college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
So, Lars, let's stick with the 2025 class here. Where is there any one player? Because we talked about Dijon Lee. Or are there are there any of the, the, the five star corner from from Mission Viejo? Are there any other players that are standing out to you that you think might be looking at this commitment from Zedrius Rainey Sale and just saying, okay, I need to consider Washington more seriously, or oh hey, they just moved way up on my list? I think in a way that. It's interesting because, I mean, it looks like Noah Flores is kind of the tight end, at least in the stage that they want. Yeah, Yeah, he's he's really good. I like him a lot. But at the same point, I look at DeAndre Waverly, and I think upside, like Hunter Bryant upside, you know, like, okay, maybe he's not a natural tight end, but those are also kind of the guys that you just naturally want to have on your roster. So when you're going against, say, a Texas or a Michigan, you can say, hey, this four-star athlete. And now, again, I know it's not the greatest example, right? Because Sam Adams was a four star and there's been other right. four stars that have come in and literally done nothing for this program. But that's not a shot at Sam, by the way. That's just a fact. Right? But it, it's also a matter of, okay, well, you're knowing how good the talent is. You certainly want to get that on the roster. I will say to your, to your exact question, I think, I don't know if an in-state Washington guy would impact, you know, <laughs> Philip Bell, Dijon Lee, some of these out-of-state guys. But I do think, you know, there's a couple of guys that, I, I, the, the Mark, uh, the, the poly linebacker. Uh, I had a core. Yeah. 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 And so um, I know, I know he congratulated him and I know he's got high interest in Washington. So I think it's, it, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. Right. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to look at the commitment and think I have to jump on my Washington offer, but I do think it kind of says, okay, Hey, there's one dude jumping, you know, there, there, there's, there's credence to it. Right. I just saw this team play for a national championship. Obviously they're going to be different next season. But the coach is still the same. DeBoer still looked, you know, pretty animated on the sideline. You know, when he was kind of in, in, in DeBoer fashion, right? You know, right. when he's like, man, like, you know, it was right there. We had it. Like, but that's good. That's exactly what you want as a coach. You don't want the coach that says, hey, well, we maxed out this roster. Now I'm going to, you know, try and, you know, go find some other three-star banged up quarterback and see if I can make that work. It's like, no, you want to get one of the more awesome back. Right, and exactly. Like you're getting one of the most prolific passers in college football history, and Will Rogers the third, and then following that up with Austin Mack as a sophomore, or you know, you know, Richard Zarp, whatever you want to call it. But so I want to I want to wind around to one of the things that you just said because you're talking about linebacker. Yeah. Where one prediction that I have for this class is it's going to look a lot like Oregon's linebacker class this past year, where it sounded like Washington was making a late push to try to flip flip a linebacker somewhere. That's that's all we can really say on the matter since it obviously didn't happen. But it, it seems like they're going to go really heavy. You talked about Mark Ahenikor, um down at, at Narbonne. And then I talked about Mason Post a little bit in the first segment, where if you can find a way to get those three guys um, combined with ZRS, of course, where you combine those three guys, that's an amazing linebacker class. And that's something that will... You know, as we saw where in, in the national championship where Washington's run defense was not very good early on in that game. And there were a lot of lanes for and, and something that um, a friend of mine pointed out to that I couldn't really tell from up in the box. But he was he, he pointed out to me from from watching the broadcast was that the linebackers were getting caught in traffic a lot. So finding a way to get some more talented linebackers in the room. And we like Carson Bruner. We love everything that Edifani Lofosio has done for this program. Uh, Alfonso Tupatala, Raylan Goforth. Like they had, they all had solid seasons, but it's about leveling up now. And another guy that I want to talk to talk about in that same vein, who recently set uh, an unofficial visit to Washington, I believe for junior day is four-star cornerback Kobe Sellers or from, uh, I believe it's Shadow Creek down here in Texas. And, that's another one where getting a guy like that to consider your program and con- continuing to stack up the high level of talent at defensive back where, you know, you talk about Caleb Presley, Curly Bryant, Leroy Reed, excuse me, Cur- uh, Curly, Curly Reed, Le- Leroy Bryant. I can't talk today. I'm exhausted. Uh, you, you Stacking them up with, with those kinds of guys and then maybe pairing with a Dijon Lee who released his top eight, put Washington in there and already has an official visit set. It looks like they're trying to get it set up for that whatever that big weekend is going to end up being. So combining all of these things and leveling up defensively where we are, we've already seen what the offense can do. It's about leveling up recruiting, especially on the defensive side of the ball there. It, it, it feels like everything is starting to fall Washington's way. And then of course, stacking that on top of a national championship appearance seems to be doing nothing but helping this team as well as the move to the big 10. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the other side of that too is when people look at this game, they're going to, I saw a lot of people like not a lot, I should say 
what a decent amount of people say, oh, you know, we need a whole new defensive coaching staff. I actually like think they probably out they they had the better coaching performance of the two sides last night. Yeah, in, in terms of they made the again now yes they got they gave up a national championship record three hundred yards rushing, but it wasn't. I mean, first of all, you knew that coming in, right? The mission was going to be able to run the ball pretty well. But I think it spoke more or less to when you look at who played in the game, Fatui, Tuli, MJ, you know, they're good, right? But now yeah. it's a matter of, hey, can we level up a little bit? Because it wasn't like, you know, when you're bringing back Javon and Armand Parker and some of those other guys, it wasn't like they were getting gashed, you know, and like they can't compete either. It's like, no, we didn't see them as much. And I think it's almost like, hey, like, watch this. And then next year when you guys are in this position, don't make the same mistakes. And then it's because, and I, it's something I know you and I are going to get to a little bit more on on tomorrow's show as well. Is talking about where additions still need to be made in the transfer portal because it feels like yeah. defensive tackle is there's still there's still room for another body. Um, but that's I, that's going to be a really big point of emphasis. Where let's see how Alinius Davis comes along this next year. Let's see how Anthony James progresses in the next year. Where you know he was a top fifty recruit when he committed to Washington, and. Getting so it's just it's about stacking these bodies. We'll see what else happens along the defensive line because I know you and I both like Josiah Sharma too. Where you talk about that position, and it just it feels like 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 we just said, it feels like everything is starting to add up the way Washington's recruiting staff and and, and coaching staff wants it to be. And then you know the the plan, the the, the plan has just been accelerated. I feel like for for making a national championship. Right. So, well, I, mean, I think the national championship accelerates the pro- the process. Is, is, sure. Is what, yeah. is what it kind of does, right? It's they they both go hand in hand together with that because yeah, when when you're looking at other teams, you know, especially you know with Florida State now making it, beating Texas in the Sugar Bowl. Now you're seeing Washington. It's like you're not just you're not beating like you know Oklahoma State in you know the Craft Fight Hunger Bowl. You're you're you're, yeah. you're beating you know you're beating marquee programs in marquee games. For more marquee opportunities. So to me, that when you're looking at recruiting and you're thinking, okay, well, now do transfers want to come in here? Well, transfers haven't been the issue, right? It's sure. And then you also remember they got Ethan Barr coming in and, and Sebastian Valdez. So they've gotten a few holes plugged, but I think it's a matter of now, okay, who leaves, who declares early, who transfers out, right? I think there's going to be a different, a decent amount of attrition on this team just. Just just naturally. That's not a shot at Washington. Just, I like how you're just giving away our whole Thursday show with who's leaving, who's coming back. <laughs> well, 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 I'm not mentioning who's coming back or who's leaving. Yeah, but, true. Um, hey, hey, we'll talk about that tomorrow, so make sure you it, tune in then. Exactly. So there we go. It was a bridge, right? I didn't, didn't, it's, 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 it's a nice little plug. It, it's a tease, not a spoiler, if you will. <laughs> but, but yeah, no. But So, yeah, but to your point, so I think that's why recruiting, especially in 25 becomes even more imperative because moving forward, you don't, you want to become Alabama in the transfer portal, meaning you're having players leave because they want other opportunities, but because you're also recruiting at the high school level at such a high level, you just need to sprinkle in, you know, the Jamison Williams, the, the tight end, you know, like one or two pieces here and there versus, Hey, we need like seven transfer additions. It's like, no, we only need like three or four at a couple key positions. And one of those is depth. And so to just to build on that a little bit more, I feel like that's kind of where this is is going, because especially when you look at getting Jeremiah Hunter at receiver and like that, that's that's the biggest one when you look at it there. And then we've I I, especially so we talk if you want to talk about Jamar Muhammad at corner for a sec, he is just saying, okay, well, here's what I can do for you now. Bring guys along behind. me, And again, Curly Reed, Leroy Bryant, Caleb Presley, we'll see what that turns into. And then the defensive line, it's similar. They did a really good job of going out and getting a bunch of high quality defensive line. We'll talk about Dominic Kirks and his, you know, and and everything going on there in a a little bit. But it's the same thing where Sebastian Valdez, BJ Green, they're they're plugging holes in a sense and bridging the gap to Noah Carter, to Rachumana Bulabulavu, to Omar Khan, to all those other guys. So there's still a lot going on up front where you can say that's, and that's where it is. And that's, and again, that's, that's one of the reasons we keep pointing at 2025 where it's like, okay, this is where it all seems like it's going to start coming together for this team and the staff. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the other part of it is where you're not, you don't want to rush those three. You want to recruit freshmen who are able to play early, but also if they can't and, 
have to register, it's not like a detriment to them and they take it as like an insult. Like, oh, hey, no Carter, I'm not going to be able to, I don't want to register. Like, oh, I don't, like Rashid Williams had the same thing this year where it's like, I'm coming in as a four star receiver. You think I want to register? No. But if I have to, I can still play three years and leave. Like, so right. these guys know it's like, hey, I'd rather take the coaching and the op and be on a national championship than go to, I don't know, Arizona or USC and win seven or eight or 10 games, but not play for a national championship and then hope that Washington comes back and be on the back end in the portal when they need an extra piece. Like, no, just commit and sure. wait your turn and then go. No, you, you're absolutely right. So we, we, we teased a little bit about Dominic Kirk's. Because there are some, so he's taking a visit to Ohio State. Silas Bolden, the Oregon State receiver, is taking a visit to Washington. I feel like those are a couple interesting things that we, we need uh, to get to at some point. But first, we need to give a shout out to our good friends over at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. There's so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays. You can find bets in the Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. The best way to find popular parlays and more is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. Lars, I feel like you know you you and I might need to do some some NFL playoff stuff here. I I kind of like the Lions to win the Super Bowl. I know they're getting pretty good odds right now. You got any one pick you want to throw out there, just in terms of, of betting wise? Because you know I'm not going to bet against the Niners, but odds odds wise, give me the Lions. Uh, give me give me the Ravens. I like it. I mean, that's an easy one, but you know, it's it, it's so hard to bet against Lamar. So just absolutely, yeah, I, I'm, I'm betting more so on Lamar than on the hard while. Yeah, I'm Love being able to get that in there for a quick second. So, Lars, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with Silas Bolden? Or do you want to start with Dominic Kirks? Let's start with Kirks, just because it's kind okay. of been the. It's almost like the elephant. No, this is not an comparison to the size of the but it's kind of in the elephant in the room, right? Where it's like, okay, he committed to Washington after that big June weekend, yep. I believe, right? And, and 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 you know, came up for the official visit then. But I get and this is not, I don't take the, I don't slight kids in the sense of oh hey well you have to talk to the media. You know, if you if you're not a media guy or you don't want to talk to the media, so be it. It's again fine. But it does kind of make it harder you know, it's rare to see guys not talk to the media and then have an incredible career. Right, and stay right. at that school for four years. Right, Trey Lowe comes to mind, where he commits, never talks to anybody once, ends up transferring out of Washington after one year. I know it's a different circumstance, but it's just to me, it was it always seemed like an interesting kind of take where you're going all the way out from Ohio. Ohio State has an offer, but then they come in the picture late after you commit to Washington. He still kind of, hasn't received an offer yet, or at least one that he's announced. Well, I, I was going to say, it's almost like the kind of, hey, if you take an official visit, we'll offer you kind of offer. And that to me yeah. would be like, and it's like, okay, like, and that's clearly he's been waiting for that offer. He's been, yeah. he took he took a visit to USC, to Ohio State during the season, took a couple other visits. Didn't actually take the visit to USC, I believe, right? At the end no, of the he day, didn't. Right? He didn't take that visit. But the fact that he was trying to take other visits, and again, no more power to the kid, right? You know, take your visit, sure. right? You, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that you're only going to get. Pretend, well, I guess now you might get it two or three times, depending on how many times you transfer. But the point being that, you know, take your time, make your decision, do whatever. But I think it's pretty clear for Washington at this point that he not only is a luxury take, but it's almost like if he does sign, I'm not saying it would be a surprise, but it would almost be like he didn't get his opportunities elsewhere and is now just taking this one at Washington. It's like, and I think if you're Washington, obviously you like the ability, right? You like the talent that he possesses. So He's very talented. Right. And so that's why, like, you know, obviously Courtney Morgan and, and the staff playing a role to get him. Obviously it's like they're not just going to throw him away. But it almost does seem like, okay, like you're trying to get this girl to go out with you for time and time again because she keeps saying, hey, like, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. After a while, I said, okay, fine, go and see. We are now taking somewhere else. So we are now kind of turning the page here. It's like if you want to if you want to rehash this in a couple of years when you're in this portal, so be it. We'll consider it then. But again, also, you know, Washington does have an edge, doesn't have an edge coach, but does have a D-line coach. So maybe there's some 
who who that, is his position coach. He said like, that that has played a part in this too. And, and so, and so again, we're worth noting for the kid, right? For transparency, that 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 also is an element of play. But I don't think he would be coming in as an edge, and even if he did as a setting the run as an edge type of guy, you got to know Cam Brechterfield. Like, I mean, to right. me, it's. So- so no, sorry. I was just to say, I think he would play a defensive end, edge, whatever you want to just say that he would be on the exterior. But and so one of the things that I, I liked about Kirks was that you talked, you just you talked about true freshmen who want to come in and play right away. That's what he would have been able to do here. That that would have been his his whole thing at Washington was I can come in, I can be part of the rotation right away because they're losing so many guys up front. And because he's really big, really physical, and just developed somewhat early in terms of just the way he plays the game, that he'd be able to fit in at the college level right away. And you wouldn't have to redshirt him, whereas you might have to with a Noah Carter or with some of the other guys where it's, yeah, we know we really like everything that you're doing, but we want you to put on a little bit more weight and we want to see what you look like at, you know, in in Noah Carter's case, 240 instead of 228. Where that's and that's where we want you to be, which is fine. That's that's totally fine. But in terms of Kirk's, it was okay. We see this guy as somebody who can play right away, and he said, "I can get a lot of snaps there." And, he, and it it kind of felt like okay, okay, haven't heard from from my hometown school. Would love to go go to Ohio State. Hasn't happened yet. And no fault to the kid for doing that, right? If Ohio State, especially a defensive line, wants to offer you props, that's awesome. More, more, more power to you as a kid from the state of Ohio. But it just, it, it feels, and it, when he didn't sign in December, especially with, you know, them losing a couple guys, it felt like, okay, we can see them bringing him in late on a visit and doing exactly what's going on now. Right. And I think that's kind of the question I was like, does he have the offer from Ohio state? And if Ohio state doesn't offer, why is Ohio state not offering? Like again, right. There's plenty of factors, right? Maybe they don't have a spot numbers, what have you, but it almost seems like usually if Ohio State wants a guy, they're going to go and get it, and yeah. they've kind of been like, in a way, slow walking it, right, where it's like, hey, you want to walk on for a year? We'll find a scholarship for you at some point, but you get to play for Ohio State in your home, you know, in your home state, or do you want to take that scholarship? And again, I'm not sliding it by saying it's a walk on. but it's like, to me, it's like, why, otherwise, why haven't they offered? And if they have, why hasn't he at least taken it? Like, just sure. again, we're not going to go down the rabbit holes because we got to talk about Silas Walden, you know, committable, uncommittable offers, things like that. But the point is, I think, you know, let's just make the pivot now because I think of the two, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's another fifteen minute conversation. <laughs> of the two, you probably you, you certainly want Silas Walden, especially knowing likely that you're losing three receivers and you're bringing back your your, your most. Maybe be what so, Jeremy Bernard and Denzel Boss would be your most accomplished receivers. Maybe Josh Jackson in there somewhere, depending on Jeremiah you. Hunter. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying in, in this. Oh, outside. Oh, just that are already in the room. Okay. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I have a lot of thoughts on this where I'm very curious to see what this looks like because I just, I don't know if Giles Jackson and Silas Bolden are going to be on the roster at the same time where Giles could grad transfer, go play one year somewhere else. And I, cause I think they're both really, really talented and it feels like this offer because Silas Bolden is taking four visits. He's going to Arizona, Texas, USC, and Washington. I think that's, he's a really talented player. I think that's a really nice set of schools for him to go visit. But I just think it's a little bit of a curious fit at Washington where it's, he's going to play in the slot because that he's just, he's a small enough guy. And with some of the other guys that Washington has, they're not going to need him to play on the outside of the formation. And then he's a really great kick returner. But you're not going to use a scholarship, even even who, who's an All American kick returner. You're not going to use a sco- like a scholarship just for a kick returner. Daniel it's Ngata not- wants Daniel Ngata wants a word because that's basically what he was the entire season was a kick returner. Like sure, I, I mean, I, I, as ludicrous as it was, I mean, again, he was a good returner, but like when I'm looking at a running back room that needs all the help it can get, and he is a running back by trade. I don't know. Yeah, I, I completely agree because, yeah, something's because to me, you can't have two five nine, five eight wide receivers on the field at the same time, let alone on the same roster, right? Because 
you kind of seeing if, if one of those two is the bridge to Keith Reynolds, right? You know, like, hey, yeah. like, we're going to have – you always want to have this one kind of scat bag, you know. You know, And you and I like Keith a lot. We were really impressed with what we saw from him in, in fall camp. Exactly. And so one of those two, it makes sense to have as, a, as the upperclassman and then Keith coming along as a redshirt freshman. But you can't have both to your point. And I think – I don't know. I mean, like, if you're Giles – it would obviously, you know, you can drag grad transfer anywhere, because, but you know, there, there's only a limited number of schools that that would work for. And then if you're Washington, I mean, it's almost like why why is Texas getting involved for Silas Bolden after you know dropping the bag for Aaron Butler? And so it's like, well, they're still losing a bunch of guys, right? Okay, and so so maybe like that's what you know that's where I, I think some of these other schools kind of make more sense for Silas. I'm more or less curious, sure. like why is Washington using that energy there? So I I think that it's they might know that Giles wants to grad transfer or that's something he's considering. Yeah. And they're saying, okay, if that happens, then we can take him. And if that happens, I think that he would be a really good fit in the offense. I like his athleticism. I like what he can do with the ball in his hands. And he can return kicks and, and punts. So that's just an added bonus there as well, where that's all great, comes in for a year, and is that bridge to Keith Reynolds, as you said. But outside of that, it's okay. Yeah, we're interested. We like you, but we it's this similar to what the Aaron Butler situation was before Jeremiah Hunter, where it's we can't take you right now. We have to figure out spots. Then we can figure that out. Yeah, and I think well, the other thing to consider is given that Vincent Nunley, uh, Giles Jackson's cousin, transferred out. When I could see maybe both of them teaming up somewhere, you know, for a year or two, or more so. Not only for a couple of years, but Giles for a year. Maybe they, maybe they both go to Cal or something like that, closer to sure. home in, in Antioch and stuff like that. Because otherwise, it's like, yeah, like, especially after being hurt, like, that'd be kind of a rough one for Giles to find a landing spot. But I'm sure he could figure it out. And I think that was always kind of puzzling to me where it's like, hey, we're going to bring him back for the last two games. Like, he played in the National Championship. I don't know if he had a target, but I think he had – he certainly played a couple of times. I had a couple of plays in there. But it did kind of seem like, hey, like, we really want to have Giles back next year. And then it's like – like, no offense to Giles, but, like, why? Like, what – what he's he's a different type of receiver than Rome, Jalen, and JP. So – I think I mean, they wanted to make sure they had an extra veteran presence in the room. Which I get, but it's almost like – there's a difference, you know, just having this, you can have like four or five veterans and, and have no veteran presence, right? Like, you know, it's, so I think to me, it's a matter of, can you actually have a contributing veteran, veteran versus just a guy that has been around for a while, but again, also is at Michigan. And it's like, you know, it's not, Giles had a great 22 season, but he only had like 31, 32 catches. So it wasn't yeah. like, it was something where it's like, hey, this is a 50, 60, 70 target kind of guy. And I think that's what he wants to try and be. And I just don't know if he can be that in this offense at that size. Silas Bolden could, but they can't both be in the same offense at the same time, to your point. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support as all this recruiting stuff continues to happen, transfer portal, everything else, and we get into the NFL draft. Make sure you stay right here on Lockdown Huskies because we're going to have so much fun new content coming for you. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We are there. We are everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day, so make sure you hit a like on the video. Leave a comment down below. Leave a five-star review if you're audio only. It all helps the channel out a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you on Thursday.